Hello, and welcome to Mind Games with Matt Farrell, the <laughs> podcast which changes its recording times until Sean finally says, look, man, this can't go on like this. <laughs> In actuality, this is still to be determined. The podcast that follows up on topics from the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell. I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer, and I am the older brother of Matt Farrell. And Matt Farrell is going to say, howdy right now. Howdy right now. Today we're going to be talking about the most recent episode, which is Liquid Air Battery Explained. Rival to lithium-ion batteries? Question mark? Mm-hmm. <laughs> this episode dropped on October 6th, 2020, and it focused on mainly an interview and discussion of the company Highview, which creates batteries using liquefied air, which of course would mean the freezing of air molecules until they took liquid form, thereby compressing them. And then later on, those compressed air molecules would be allowed to warm up, re-expand, turn turbines, and create electricity. It is so simple, even a Sean can understand it. <laughs> One of the things lurking in the comments that I thought was interesting were some people actually struggled with the concept from a, but how are you going to use electricity to compress the air in the first place? Duh. And missing the larger point of your video, which is this is a place where the overflow of wind turbines and solar would be mm -hmm. used Yep. So that you're effectively using excess energy during the day or during wind periods to compress air so that when you are out of day or wind periods, you have compressed air to turn turbines. Correct? Correct. Yes. That's that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. It's I think the simplicity of that is almost what causes it to escape people's understanding. I, it's funny how it, there is a misunderstanding around this stuff when this basic premise is used every day and has been for years. Like pumped hydro energy storage is doing this exact thing. Like I bring it up in the video, but there's, I think it's down in Virginia. There's this massive facility that's doing this, is pumping water basically up to a reservoir that's up a hill using the excess energy. And then when they need it, they basically just release the water back down the hill. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which turns a turbine and they can't get that energy back. So it's, this is not a new concept. Well, even, even better than that was in your comments, one of the comments that caught my eye was somebody who just casually posted the word Trump, T-R-O-M-P-E. <laughs> Do you know what a Trump is? No. Maybe you know it as its alternate spelling. It is sometimes spelled T-R-O-M-B-E because it's such an old word. It's one of those words that predates the restriction on flippage of letters. Symbols could be used both ways sometimes. Uh huh. It's a device that goes back to the Iron Age. It is something that farmers who had streams on their land would build in order to get this, create compressed air. You're kidding. There is a Wikipedia page. I recommend people check it out. It is fascinating. A Tromp, T-R-O-M-P-E. Just type that into Wikipedia and you will even see illustrations on how to make your own in case you are a farmer and have a stream on your land. It is a process of building a long pit, a deep pit that goes, you basically are creating a U-shaped tunnel in the ground and the uh -huh. water going from the stream goes into a pipe. And as the pipe goes down, there are little inlet pipes that come out diagonally upward from that pipe that allow air to go in with the water. They get forced down with the water until they reach the bottom of the U-shape. And as they start to come up, the air is released into a chamber, which is held <laughs> with a cap at the top. The water itself continues to be allowed to flow up and out. So you're effectively creating sort of a, a waterfall. Right. That then the water is then allowed to come back up and return to the original part of the stream. But the compressed air is trapped. And then the compressed air could be used as needed. That is trippy. That is yeah. so cool. Yeah. Look at Sean dropping the knowledge. So... <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't even me. It was one of your it was one of your commenters who I should have That's awesome. paid attention to their name. I apologize for stealing their thunder, but I saw that and I thought it is crazy that this 21st century industry that is building around this is effectively using something that has existed since the Iron Age when somebody somewhere <laughs> said, oh, you know what? I've noticed that when waterfalls go 
there's lots of air bubbles that come out of the water underneath the waterfall. Maybe we could do something with that. That is really cool. Yeah. Human ingenuity. It's fan- fascinating. It it's is. Really clever. It's, I kept thinking about your former landlord in Boston who kept <laughs> describing to you how the Greeks dis- discovered <laughs> levels. It's like a scale. Have, it's, it's like, like a scale. scale. Memories of him holding his, holding up a paintbrush and a uh, <laughs> a big pen, and tipping them back and forth to demonstrate what a scale is. It's like right. I, 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 I Charlie, I know what a scale is. <laughs> Good old Charlie, uh, Miss Charlie. So back to Highview and their Trump. Your interview. There were a lot of unanswered questions mm-hmm. that came out of the interview. The first being, where is that man? <laughs> in an undisclosed location. He was in the UK okay. talking talking to me from their UK office, but I and don't, he, I, I think he's from, I don't, I don't remember where he's actually from though. I wondered if it was a Spanish or a Portuguese accent. Yeah. He sounded like it was. No, I think he's have, in, Sp- I think he's in Spain. It may have uh, been Spanish. Normally. Which, you know, the sort of global aspects of all of this are also yeah. pretty cool. How did you come into contact with them? Um, I came across them, I don't know, it was like six months ago or something when I was doing research for another video and I found it fascinating and I kept, I had it on the back of my list of like, keep looking into that. That looks interesting. And I kept looking into it and another YouTuber just have a think, put out a video on liquid air battery storage. And I was like, ah, oh, look, he beat me to it. But I kept reading into it and Highview Power held several, has held several webinars where they walk investors or press through what their technology is and how it works, uh, potential clients. And I, I attended several of these webinars, getting more and more information through those. And I got to the point where I was like, okay, I feel comfortable enough with my understanding of this. And I think that this is a legit company that I want to reach out to them. So I reached out to their press contacts and introduced myself and said I was hoping I could interview somebody like from the, either their CTO or their CEO or anybody that'd be willing from these webinars I had heard talk. I was like, I was open to talking to anybody, but I was just wanted to talk to somebody about the technology. And that's when they uh, lined up a chance for me to talk to Javier. And to be very clear, no money changed hands. This was not a sponsored video. This was right. me interested in the technology, doing spending months reading about it, attending webinars, reaching out to them because I wanted to kind of sit down and finally do a video on it. I thought it'd be really helpful to have them explaining some of their business to uh, the people themselves. Right. And Javier, what was his role? He's the CEO and he just joined the company a couple of years ago, but the company's been around for like 14 years or something like that. And they've, they're just now getting into a a final stages. They're getting into final stages, meaning they are in the building. early stages of building actual plants. Yeah, they, they are now exit because the past 14 years has been all about like a startup. It's like the research phase, which moved into a pilot plant, which moved into a demonstrator plant. And now they're exiting the demonstrator plant and they're doing full-fledged, for-use, legit, big storage facilities all around the world. And they've got two that they're working on right now in the US, one in Vermont. And then he mentioned in the video, there's like 40 more that are in the works, like Mm. in the early stages of negotiations right now. So it's like, I had no idea that they were that far. 40 more worldwide. I think that was just the U S he said something about there's, it sounds like hundreds of areas they're talking to around the world for this kind of stuff. But in the U S alone, it was 40. I believe it was. That's an impressive number when it is a technology that to you. And by, by saying you, I mean me or an individual person just hearing about this. Yeah. And hearing this and thinking of it as a startup, 40 sounds quite impressive. But you have to remember, they're, they've been around for 14 years. They've finally perfected their technology, and now they're kind of rolling it out. And I just find it fascinating. They went from like zero to 60, like very quickly, once right. they got past their demonstrator plant. I, I'm, I really hope that they do allow me to go in and see the facility in Vermont when it's completed, because I really yeah. want to see it in person. Do you know anything about the Vermont site? Is it associated with a solar panel or a wind turbine farm? I don't know a lot of details about it, but I do know that the utility that is building it is, it has problems with, they're trying to manage their, their load Mm -hmm. and they have trouble with that. Matthew, aren't we all? I'm I'm always having trouble, but that's part of the reason why they were looking to energy storage. It, 
it may not be completely because they want to store renewable energy, but they're trying to basically just smooth things out. And this is a way that they can they're avoid maybe not building able to meet peaker plants. Peak yeah. capacity, right? Correct. Yeah. It's it's a way to help them manage their peak load, which is what this is designed for. It's 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 this kind of system will reduce the need for peaker plants, um, which is why it's so exciting it seems like this would be the sort of thing that you'd have the main plant and then i imagine scaling it up is simply adding more containment as opposed to adding more compression centers correct so you could actually start off small and quickly scale up if you needed to it's all modular it's like the the actual thing that generates electricity the turbine there's different sizes of turbines you can get like this is a 10 megawatt turbine. This is a 20 megawatt turbine. So you could just upgrade that if you wanted to increase the output. If you want to increase the storage capacity, you just add more tanks. So it's a very modular, easy to grow. As long as you have the space for it, you can just keep expanding it. And to me, the most exciting part about this is it's using like those containers. We use them for natural gas already. Like this is not something that new has to be built out. There's already an infrastructure in place with people building these tanks already. And you're just using them for air instead of natural gas right. or propane. And the other thing that's super exciting is that there's a such a clear transition for jobs. And that's yeah. one of the big things like with coal going away, you're talking about 40 to 50,000 more people that will slowly lose their jobs over the next decade or two. Well, in this regard, if we're transitioning from fossil fuels into renewables, here's a whole bunch of stuff that requires, you know, natural gas understanding and how to build and maintain these systems it's directly it is like a clear line to okay well we're just not doing natural gas now we're just doing air and we're just shooting out this turbine it's like the guys that know how to do setting this stuff up keep it running it's the same people so it's like super exciting to me of like we're kind of killing two birds with one stone you're able to transition jobs cleanly and you're also able to get, build a better energy system on clean technologies it's just it's like the, it's like a win-win where when you're talking about battery installations that's something completely different and it's needed but it's going to cause job losses in one sector while it creates jobs in a different one this right. one there's a nice clear transition what is the speed of return of energy somebody in the comments and I know they were wrong in how they were framing it, but somebody said, well, the only way you could get this liquefied air to return to be able to heat, you know, to be able to expand again would be to allow it to return to room temperature on its own. And that would take too long. And I thought, well, clearly no. that's not how they're doing this. No, they're that's not, not just how like they're doing it. Opening up a thing and saying like, well, I hope it warms up eventually. No, that, that's the whole point of they're storing, they're storing the cold and they're storing the heat that's part of this whole process. There's actually heat that's generated from the, the cooling process. Yeah, you're extracting heat from one thing and the machinery you're using is generating its own heat. They capture all of that heat and store it. And the reason they're doing that is because they use that heat during the thawing process. So it's like, they're not just like leaving this out, like a, taking an ice cube and leaving it on the countertop to let it melt on its own time. Right. They're, they're heating it. So to, to speed up how quickly that can be released. It's just so clever to me because they're using the heat and the cold that's captured. Because when you heat something up, they're also then extracting the cold from it and storing the cold mm -hmm. <laughs> to use during the, the cryogenic process again, they've created this whole, like, it's just a virtuous circle. You're not getting 100% return from it. But right. it helps there's got to be entropy in there. Yeah, there's entropy in there. And so that's why it's not 100% efficient, but it's efficient enough to make it cost effective and to make it a viable system. The thing that they, I kind of touched on is to talk about the speed of this, it is not as fast as a battery. Like a battery can respond to energy needs within milliseconds. Where this, you're talking, you might be talking seconds. So it's like it's not as fast for mitigating little mini spikes that you would have on a utility, but it can it can easily handle broader broader needs. So it's like it's that's part of why it kind of like he he said he goes we're like the big fat brother Tolan, you know, like we're arm in arm in this. It's like yeah. he doesn't see lithium ion as a competitor. And in fact, some of the webinars I attended. Uh, one of their, the guys, one of the engineers from their company said, we see this like the perfect pairing is a battery storage plant 
with one of these because here's the battery storage plant that can do the millisecond uh, energy distribution over the course of 24 hours, just like these little millisecond like needs here and there. Spikes, and yeah. Then, yeah. And then you've got this liquid air storage that's handling the long periods of need for like right. that three hour hump that you have Meeting in the, the evening or overnight. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, it's like the two of them combined create this perfect kind of like storage system. Another thing that was raised in the comments by more than a couple of people was what is the potential for using this to actually clean the air that is going in and out of a liquid state as far as things like impurities in the air, everything from CO2 to other gases that might not be considered safe for people. It does it does that. It's a it's a natural part of the process of doing this. It's purifying the air. So the air that comes out at the end is cleaner than the air that came in. The different elements of air like nitrogen and you know, oxygen, they all freeze at different temperatures. And during the, th the freezing process, the, from the way I understand it is CO2 is naturally extracted through this process. Mm. So it's like, if you wanted to have a carbon capture system as part of this, you could, it's like, they're not capturing the carbon as part of their process, but you could, there's other business potential that you could do with these machines, essentially that <laughs> it's just, it, it, like how I brought up how like the the guy that invented this process uh, used it to create neon lights because right. he was able to separate out the neon. It's just part of how this works. So it's like you could do whatever you want with it. It's not like it would t be hard. It's technology that's been around for a very long time. It's just, do you want to spend the money to be able to do that is the question. Right. But as Javier himself said, it all comes down to the dollar. Can you do that in a cost effective way? And that will determine if people do it or not. So if it does, right. if a if a country wants to extract the CO two for carbon capture, and they can make sense of the finances to make it a reality, they absolutely can. There's nothing that would prevent this technology from doing that. It's part of the reason why in these videos I often will focus on the costs, like the levelized cost of energy and things like that, because not everybody believes in climate change. Not everybody cares about it. Not everybody agrees as to what's causing it. But everybody can pretty much agree on, oh, well, this will make electricity cheaper. Yeah, well, let's do it. So it's right. like it's that's part of the reason why I bring that up a lot, because my personal motivations may not be your personal motivations, but we can both agree, hey, if we can get cheaper energy, that's that's a win for everybody. So right. that's that's part of why I bring that up a lot. And, and speaking of costs. Yeah, I was going to say, I should probably bring this up. You you <laughs> did not bring up costs in this video and some people in the comments were bringing that up saying yeah, yeah but what is that cost right now the projection is for basically a i had, I had to pull up my notes uh for like a 10 hour facility like a 200 megawatt two gigawatt hour system costs about 140 dollars per megawatt hour which puts it in the grand scheme of things it's slightly it's cheaper than than lithium-ion batteries and the larger the system gets the lower that price gets Right. And that's not true for lithium ion batteries. There's a kind of a ceiling lithium ion hits and kind of like just levels off where this actually gets cheaper the larger you make it. I was saying to you before we started recording, they haven't, they've only built a pilot plant and a demonstrator plant and they're building their first like legit plants from the ground up now. And one of the first ones is going to be in Vermont. That's not too far from me. So it's like, we'll, we'll start to see what the actual benefits of these systems are very quickly in the coming like two, three years. It's similar to what happened with Tesla with the Hornsdale power reserve they built out. People were doubting that it was going to be able to turn a profit. And then in the first six months, it saved <laughs> tens of millions of dollars and basically paid for itself in less than a year. And it's still wow. going. So it's like the value of these systems will prove themselves very quickly. So I'm, I'm very excited to see this one get built, come online, and then we can actually see what its benefits going to be. That's dumbfounding that it paid for itself that quickly. It was, it was astonishing. People were really doubting that it was going to help. And it was, Oh, this has saved $50 million in like six months. I was like, Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> in the first year, it's like $119 million. It saved. It's like, how much did it cost? It cost like $40 million to build. Okay. Build more. It's like of you those. can hear the record scratching. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And that, 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 that system was what I was talking about before about the perfect pairing with this, because that system wasn't built to do, you know, use renewables overnight. That's not what that system was built to do. It was built to 
level out the energy uses and to handle the spikes and basically to do to sell energy at wholesale prices when it was most profitable for the utility to basically it's like think about it like it's energy day trading with real energy is basically what it's doing and the amount of money it saved was astonishing and it's it's also helped to stabilize the energy system where it's being used so it's <laughs> It's a it's a benefit for the end user, which is people in their homes, and then it's a benefit for the utility because it's saving tons of money. So it's like this kind of system. Hopefully, we'll do something similar where, over the first like year or two, we'll see how much it's actually saving. And one last item that we wanted to touch on. Well, I wanted to touch on. Matthew did not want to touch it. Rare earth metals. <laughs> yes. Lots of comments. Yeah. Lots of comments, Matthew. Woo! Lithium is not a rare earth metal. No, it's not. It's sure not. But I said the word rare earth and I said, I said to Sean, before we start recording, I, when I said it, I was like, I, I don't think that's ac- completely accurate. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. And I didn't fix it and I should have fixed it because but you were yes. like, ah, oh, we'll clean it in post. Yeah, we'll clean it in post. And we never cleaned it in post. So yes, it's lithium is not a rare earth metal or a rare earth material. There's very specific there's very specific elements that are considered rare earth and yes. none of them are, are in lithium ion batteries. So I shouldn't have said that. I, you know, mea culpa. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those. It's fine if you're saying it casually in yeah. conversation, but you're putting it onto video. It's permanent. And every time somebody watched it, there, you see there this, are people. You see this a lot. You see this a lot. Like you, if you go online, Wall Street Journal has articles that say you know lithium ion and rare earth stuff Mm -hmm. it's like it's very common for like like it's almost like in the vernacular of how we talk about this stuff but something like rare earth i think it in your videos especially since you you are talking about the chemistry of some of these things it's i I could understand why people would say you shouldn't be throwing that term in there when it's not accurate it's the same thing happened to me when in the beginning when i was starting to talk about batteries and i used the term energy density when i actually meant specific energy because Everybody, like in the vernacular, it's like everybody says, oh, what's the energy density of that battery? Mm-hmm. And it's like, that's how I was using it. But that was technically not correct. And so I've been very careful of how I use that right. term going forward because I'm talking about these things in a technical way. So I need to be right. technically accurate. So yes. may culpa, I will not say rare earth <laughs> unless it actually is rare earth. Well, I, for one, appreciate your apology. And know that I will sleep better tonight. I'm sure you will. (laughs) So before we end the episode, we'll do what we usually do, which is spin off into non-technical matters. Movies, TV shows, things we're doing to pass the pandemic. And I will start. And I wanted to mention, I'm I'm clearly following a theme. (laughs) And I wanted to mention two things in particular. One is a new show on Hulu which is called Monsterland. Oh yeah, I saw that pop up. It is a anthology series, so it's in the vein of Twilight Zone. It was based on a a book of short stories and they've used that as sort of the jumping off point. And the subject of the stories was people dealing with problems in their lives and how those problems push them to do monstrous things. So it's sort of the the dividing line between good and bad acts mm-hmm. and with a supernatural twist layered on top of it. So it's this this monstrous inner workings are reflected in the outer plot of the stories. And so far, the ones we've watched, I think we've watched three now. They've all been, I think, really well done. The show they remind me most of is Tales from the Dark Side, which Hmm. was a show that was on in the late 70s, early 80s. And it was a show that creeped me out when I was a kid. I loved watching it, but I hated watching it because it gave me nightmares. (laughs) I was a very, I was a delicate child. and No no comment. (laughs) Yeah, I was (laughs) very sensitive. (laughs) <laughs> I I was so sensitive that when I was a teenager and saw turned on the TV and there was a clip of Rambo playing and in it was first blood there was a booby trap set up that caught a sheriff unaware so that this plow 
equipment went through his legs. And so I turn on the TV. I see this guy in the woods. I hear a snap. The thing swings. He's suddenly impaled. It's all happened in three seconds just as the TV warmed up. <laughs> and that gave me nightmares. And I was a, I was like 15 or 16 at the time. And that gave me nightmares for weeks and made me afraid to go into our house bathroom. I don't think I ever revealed to you that I was terrified of going into that bathroom. Because, the because bathroom, of Rambo. Because of First Blood. <laughs> The bathroom we had was basically like a railroad style bathroom. You walked in the door of the bathroom to the right was the tub. You had to walk long, all the way completely yeah. past the tub to get to where the sink was. And then past the sink was the toilet. And the light switch was strategically stupidly located past the tub. You so had to walk, walk in the dark. Completely in, in the, the dark all the way halfway through the the bathroom to get to the sink to turn on the light <laughs> that walk past the tub was nauseatingly terrifying for me well it and i it mean was to, it was I, to me like, too sean for for a different reason because we had squirrels in the attic and yeah. you'd be walking through there and sometimes would hear yeah as you're walking through the dark room it didn't help that the entrance to the attic was right across from the toilet so you're walking into a dark room. You know the attic is right there. There's noises in the attic. And who knows that Rambo hasn't put a booby trap in the tub. So, <laughs> and I'm talking about being like a 15 and 16 year old kid walking into that bathroom and thinking like, uh, and it was always terrifying. So I'm a sensitive, sensitive child. Tales from the Dark Side used to creep me out, even though I loved watching it. Just the intro, which would, I don't know if you remember that show. Yes. Oh, I, I remember that show. The intro, which would show the woods in black and white, and then the colors would reverse so that the black and white would flip. Yeah. And the narrator would say, Tales from the Dark Side. Dark side. And I would yeah. just be like, no. <laughs> and then I would stay and watch. <laughs> this show reminds me of that. It's very character driven. It's not just, there's something in the closet. There's, there's something in the closet, and this person is not built to handle that. Right. And you're really looking at both sides of it. And, and so I find it, um, I find it fascinating. I find it really good. Cool. And the other thing I wanted to mention, it's a new show on Netflix called The Haunting of Bly Manor. And it's from the same people who last year produced the show, The Haunting of Hill House. And it includes some of the same actors from that. So they're doing sort of a American horror story style reuse of the same cast totally different characters so it's not a sequel it's just the same people working with the same people and i think that that's absolutely fine and in some ways it's better than if they were trying to do a second season of a series that had completed its story yeah the haunting of hill house was a tv series based on a gothic horror novel written by shirley jackson and as an aside there is also a movie about Shirley Jackson that came out a few months ago and it's very worth watching and it is not a horror story it is just about her mm -hmm. but her personal life was pretty intense and um that so I recommend that movie as well but Hill House was based on her book and the new series is inspired by it's not based on anything specific but it's inspired by henry james's the turn of the screw mm. so this producer writer is going back and taking classics of the genres uh of horror and he's taking the the classics that are so deep in horror's gothic roots that it's not about it's about mood and it's about intensity of moments as right. opposed to there being this monster it's yes it's suspense it's all it's about suspense the, and tension it's the brilliant yeah. suspense and tension of all that and it's so it's very well done and i recommend i recommend both the haunting of hill house and the newer season the haunting of blind manor cool yeah the the my recommendation is not a horror thing but on Netflix, there's a series, they're in their second season now. It's called Criminal. And there's different versions of this around the world. There's Criminal UK, Criminal Germany, I think Criminal France. There's different ones you can watch. Um, I watched last year Criminal UK, 
and loved it. And the second season is out right now. <laughs> and in a similar way to that suspension tension, this this show is it's a procedural, and I love procedurals. I you know, Law and Order, love that show. Uh, Columbo, those kind of things. And Criminal is basically that, but it's only about the interrogation. And the entire show feels like a stage play because it basically takes place for most of it in like one of two or three rooms. Like there's a hallway, (laughs) there's behind the glass, and then there's on the other side of the glass in the interrogation room. And it's all about these interrogators trying to get the person that they think committed a crime to confess or trip themselves up and to make that final arrest. Um, It's, (laughs) it is so good. It is, it, some of the episodes have will have you on the edge of your seat and it's three people talking across the table. <laughs> it, is, it is really good. It's visually stunning. They're really clever in their camera work to keep it visually engaging considering you're only bouncing between one of three locations where they're doing these juxtapositions of the reflections on the glass versus the character and the how they're shooting the characters over their shoulder and the way that they're, it's just, I, I can't, I eat this show up. It is so, so freaking good. And the second season, I just watched the second episode, which because it's a procedural, each each episode has different guest stars. And uh, the guest star, the person that was basically being interrogated in this episode was um, the guy who played Jon Snow from Game of Thrones. It was Kit Harington. And mm. The episode starts with just the camera straight on him as if you're the interrogator. He's talking right at you. And he's going, listen, before we even start, let me just explain. I got to explain what happened. And it's him just talking at you for like what feels like five minutes. And it's riveting. And this show just gives actors who are good at acting a chance to really kind of show their, their chops and to kind of show off what they can actually do because it's like a stage play. There's like this uncut sequence of him for five minutes, just going on about telling his side of the story. And it was just so riveting and so good. And that episode just blew me away. So it's like, I would Mm -hmm. highly recommend checking out uh, criminal. um, If you, if you enjoy that kind of thing, it's, it's a lot of talking. There's not people running around with guns, (laughs) It's, but it is still extremely exciting. You'll be sitting on the edge of your seat. It's really, really good TV. So I hope everybody will let us know what they think, either about the programs that we've just talked about or about the YouTube video we just discussed. You can reach out to us through Twitter at still TBD FM. You can reach out to me directly at by Sean Farrell. And you can reach out to Matt directly at either at Matt Farrell or at Undecided MF. Please be sure to watch for the latest videos from Undecided with Matt Farrell on YouTube. And you can find the podcast at stilltbd.fm. Please do subscribe to both the YouTube videos and to the podcast. You can find the podcast at all major podcast providers like iTunes or Spotify. Please be sure to give us a rating, a review, and share us with your friends. It really does help the podcast. The podcast helps the channel. The channel helps Matthew. And then we can't figure out what time we're going to record. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you next time.